The Dumb Witch Horror by H. P. Lovecraft Chapter 4 For a decade the annuals of the wet leaves sink indistinguishably into the general life of morbid community, used to their queer ways and hardened to their May Eve and all hallowed orgies. Twice a year they light fires on top of the centre of the hill, at which times the mountain rumblings would occur with greater and greater violence, while at all seasons there were strange and pretentious doings at the lonely farmhouse. Of course, the time callers professed to hear sounds in a sealed upper story. Even when all the family were downstairs, they wondered how swiftly or lingeringly a cow bullock was usually sacrificed. The talk of complaints to society for the prevention of cruelty to animals, and nothing never came of it, since Dunwich folk are never anxious to call the outside world's attention to themselves. About 1923, when Wilbur was a boy of ten, whose mind, voice and stature and bearded face gave all the impressions of maturity, the second great siege of Carpentry went on at this old house. It was all inside a sealed upper part, and bits of discarded lumber people had concluded that the youth, his grandfather, knocked out all the partitions and even moved the attic floor, leaving only one vast open void between the ground story and the peaked roof. They had torn down a great central chimney too, fitted a rusty range with a flimsy outside tin stovepipe. Outside tin po- stovepipe. In spring after this event, Old Whitley noticed the growing number of well woolly wool wells and would come out of the haunt spring glen to chirp under his window at night. He seemed to regard the circumstance as one of the great sacrifice or great sacrifice. Significance as one of great significance, and told the lounges of the Oswalds he thought the time had almost come. They whistled just in tween. It was my breathing knoll, he said. I am guess they're gritting ready to catch my soul. They know it's a going out, out and done and calculated to miss it. You know, boys, I'll, I'll go on whether they get me or not. If they do, they're keeping us singing and laughing till day to day. If they don't, they quite a down, down quite kind of quite down her, like I expect their murmur souls, they hunts for they some tough pretty tough tussles them sometimes. On Lembus Eat night nineteen twenty four, Dr. Halton of Ellsbury was hastily summoned by Wilbur Watley, who had lashed his one remaining horse for the darkness and telephoned for Mosbourne's in the village. Found a Watley in a very grave state with cardiac action and stertorous breathing that told of an end not far off. The shapeless Albino daughter and oddly shaped bearded grandson stood by the bedside whilst a vacant abscess overheard there came a disquieting suggestion of rheumatic surging or lapping as of the waves on some level beach. A doctor, though, was chiefly disturbed by the chattering night birds outside, seemingly an enormous limitless legion of well little poorly wheels that cried their endless message and repetitions, climbed diabolically to the wheezing grass of the dying man. It was uncanny and natural. Too much, thought Dr. Horton. Like the whole of the region he had entered so reluctantly in response to the urgent call. So towards one o'clock, old Whatley gained consciousness and interrupted his reasoning to choke out a few words to his grandson. More space, Willie. More space soon, he groans, and the muck grows farther. Are you ready to stir? See you soon, boy. Open up the gates to Yoke Snubber with a long chant. You will find on page 751, complete edition, and I now put a match to the prison. Fire from it, if it can burn in an hour. hour. He was obviously quite mad, I was appalled, during which the flock of the whirly port wheels outside adjusted their cries to the altered tempo, while some indications of the strange hill noises came from the far off. He added another sentence or two. Feed it regular, Willie, and mind the quality. I done let it go too fast. 
for the police. For it first quarters or gets about after he opens the yog software. It's all over and no use. Only them from beyond the net can make it multiply and work. Only them the old ones that wants to come back. But speech gave place to grass again. Avina screamed away the girl of the pool who swallowed the charge. It was the same from then, but then more than an hour. When the final fluttery grotto came, Dr. Hilton drew shrunken lids out of lazy grey eyes as the tumult of birds faded impeccably to silence. Now Avina sobbed, but Wilbur only chuckled, whilst the old hill noises rumbled faintly. He didn't get him, he murmured, murmured in his heavy bass voice. Wilbur was by this time a scholar of really tremendous eradica- eradication. He in his one sided way, was quietly known by correspondence of many librarians, distant places where rare and forbidden books of old days were kept. He was more and more hated and dreaded around Dunwich because of a certain youthful disappearances which suspicion laid vaguely at his door, but was always able to silence inquiry through fear, through use of the fund of old time gold, which still at his firm father's time went forth regularly and increasingly for cattle buying. He is now tremendously mature of aspect, his height having reached a normal adult limit, seemed inclined to whack beyond that figure. In 1925, a scholarly correspondent from Mr. Dick University called upon him one day, a party pale and puzzled. He was fully six and three quarters feet tall. For all the years, Wilbur had treated his half deformed Abina mother with a growing contempt, finally forbidding her to go to the hills with him on May Eve and Holy Mass. In 1926, a poor creature complained to Mamie Bishop of being afraid of him. There's more about him, as I know the king will tell thee, Mimi, she said. And nowadays, there's more nor that I know myself. I ain't no afraid of God. I don't know what he wants, nor what he's trying to do. Halloween. The hill noises sounded louder than ever. A fire burned on Sentinel Hill, as usual. People paid more attention to the musical river ball. Screaming vast flocks of unnaturally bleated, belated willipole wheels, which seemed to be assembled near the old unlighted workly farmhouse. After midnight, their shrill notes burst in a kind of pennant maniac, carved a nation, which filled all the countryside, and not until dawn did they finally quieten down. Then they vanished hurriedly southward where they were fully a month overdue. What this meant, no one could quite be certain. Till later, none of the folk, folk seemed to have died, but poor Whit- Lavina Whitley, the twisted Albina, was never seen again. The summer of 1927, Wilbur repaired to his shed to the farmyard, began moving his books and effects out for them. Soon afterwards, Earl Sawyer, Told the lounges at Osborne's that more coffee was do- going on in the Wilbur's farmhouse. Wilbur was closing all the doors and windows on the ground floor and seemed to be taking out partitions as he and his grandfather had done upstairs four years before. He was leaving in one of the sheds and saw it for he seemed unusually worried and tormentalous. T- t- People generally suspected him of knowing something about his mother's disappearance. Very few ever approached his neighbourhood now. His height increased to more than seven feet and showed no signs of ceasing its development.